All right. Um, so my name is Jill Moore. I am the uh, new uh, Phase 4 ENCODE uh, DAC project manager. And I'm going to be talking today about um, an overview of the registry of uh, CREs that we created at the end of the third phase of the ENCODE project. Um, as uh, Ji Ping mentioned, I'm then going to hand it over to Michael that's going to give you an overview of the online tool screen that you can use to access the registry. And then we're going to go through some use cases of actually how you can apply the registry um, to try to annotate genetic variants, learn more about uh, disease-associated genes, and actually apply it to your research. So this is an overview of the ENCODE registry of CREs. CRE stands for Candidate Regulatory Elements, as Ji Ping has already mentioned. So what it actually is, is it's a collection of regions that may have different functions. So as you mentioned, we have promoter-like elements, enhancer-like elements, and what we're referring to as CTCF-only-like elements, which may function as insulators or possibly um, the anchors of different chromatin loops. What we actually did to create this was incorporate data from hundreds of cell and tissue types. So we have over 600 unique uh, cell types included in the registry for human and over 100 for mouse. And for this, we actually collected data um, from both the ENCODE project and incorporated data from the Roadmap Epigenomics project as well. Um, what we did is we created registries in both human and mouse, and this allowed us to be able to compare across species as well and look at um, elements that are conserved between the two. And so this is a, a brief overview of actually how we created the registry of CREs. Um, we based everything on what we're calling representative DNA hypersensitivity sites. So if we look in the genome here in green um, are signal tracks from DNA-seq experiments. So DNA-seq assays open regions of chromatin, and presumably these regions are open due to transcription factor binding. And, and they, these regions may have putative regulatory regions because of these TFs binding, interacting with one another, and interacting with transcriptional machinery. When we looked across the genome, we can see that a lot of these sites are fairly consistent across different cell types. So these are six different randomly surveyed cell types here. As we can see, even across, uh, for example, placenta tissue compared to natural killer cells, the regions of uh, DNA's hypersensitivity tend to be fairly consistent between the cell types. So we use this um, fact to actually create what we're calling representative DHSs. So what we did is uh, for over 400 uh, cell types with DNA's data, we clustered all these regions together and picked a representative uh, DHS or DNA hypersensitivity site to uh, represent each one of these clusters. And uh, as you can see here, these are the black um, DHSs up at the top. So we did this um, for a human across 400 cell tissue types and for over 60 cell types in mouse. And our next step was then to try to annotate these RDHSs with other uh, epigenomic signals to try to understand what their putative regulatory function might be. So we incorporated um, uh, three additional signal types, uh, two histone modification uh, ChIP-seq data sets, H3K4 me3, which is known to bind promoters, uh, known to be enriched promoters, as well as some um, distal enhancers, um, H3K27 AC, which is known to be uh, enriched at active enhancers and active promoters, and then we also incorporated uh, CTCF uh, transcription factor chip seq binding as well. And this is just a bit of a global view where here we have the gene SP1. We see high histone mark signal at the, um, near the transcription start site of this gene. And then we have some distal regulatory elements here. This one would be enhancer-like since we have high H827AC. Uh, this one would be CTCF only, possibly an insulator, possibly the anchor of a chromatin loop. So we have two types of classification schemes um, based on these other uh, marks. One is what we call cell type agnostic. So this is a classification, for example, promoter-like, enhancer-like, that's not going to change across cell and tissue types. So to create this, we use this a bit of a complicated flow chart here, but essentially it looks at the uh, maximum signal of these three supplementary epigenomic marks across all cell and tissue types. It also considers distance from transcription start sites. So for example, if you have a, um, a region that has high hdk 27 ac and high hdk 4 me 3 but it's very far, very distal from a transcription start site, it's more likely to be an enhancer than, for example, a novel promoter element. So for these uh, classifications, um, they stay the same across all cell and tissue types. But we also wanted to have cell type specific annotations as well. So this is, for example, a particular region 
what's its activity, say, in B cells compared to T cells compared to the brain. And so we did this for every single um, uh, CRE in an over 600 cell types for humans. And this is just an example of what that actually looks like. Um, this is done in uh, GM12878, which is a lymphoblastoid cell line. Here, we can have all these different combinations of signal. So for example, here, we can have high um, of all four marks. Other cases, we may just have high HCV27AC and DNAs. Um, and so, but in order for our CRE to be active in the cell type, we do require it, require it to have high DNA signal by definition. So we have all these different combinations of signal, we want to try to combine them together into a, a little bit of an easier way so biologists maybe are interested in all enhancer-like elements that are active in GM12878 or all promoter-like elements. So it's a little bit tough to distinguish what those are from just these signals here. So what we did is we looked at um, complementary signal uh, for Col2, EP300, and Red21 to see if these uh, separate groups clustered into sort of any naturally forming groups. When we looked at uh, this group up here, we looked at EP300. That's a transcription factor that's known to bind enhancers. We had this group up here that had really high EP300 signal. We classified those as enhancer-like. We also had this natural group here that had really high Red21. Uh, signal, and RED21 tends to co-localize with CTCF, particularly at the anchors of chromatin loops. So that seemed to be another naturally forming group there. And then we had these groups that had very high um, all 2 so presumably they're going to be you near know, transcription start sites and are going to be promoter-like. So this is just our new classification scheme here. If we take these more simplified groups, such as promoter-like signatures or PLS, enhancer-like signatures, ELS, CTCF only, and then a group of DNAs only. So we have this for all of the CREs that we uh, identified in the genome. Um, we also were able to validate um, experimentally this classification scheme. So for example, these ELS uh, CREs here, we um, annotated them in mouse as well um, through some of the uh, embryonic time points that Ji Ping had mentioned before in that matrix. And then Len Panacchio and Axel Missile actually experimentally tested them in uh, embryonic mouse transgenic assays. Um, and so our, our high ranking uh, ESL series uh, tended to have greater success than the lower ranking ones. So this is just a, an overview of what we've actually defined. In humans, we have 1.3 million uh, CREs, and in mouse, we have just over 400,000 CREs. And this is the breakdown of their cell type agnostic classifications. Um, this is just a, a, a brief overview of um, even though we don't have every single cell and tissue type um, assayed in the registry, overall we do have fairly high coverage. So here we took um, cell types that don't have DNAs data to see um, what the overlap of their histone marks uh, peaks are in, um, um, in the registry. So for example, we won't have any anchors for these cell types, but still by combining multiple cell types together, we're able to pick up most of the um, DNA hypersensitivity sites in the